Belgrave Square, London, one evening in 1907. An elegant couple steps out of a limousine and rushes inside the magnificent Downshire house. A gust of wind sends a shiver through the lady. An icy wind blows over the inland seas, the vast snowfields of Greenland. The sea is iced over, white, everything is white. The red-faced butler announces Mr. and Mrs. Bruce Ismay. Ismay, manager of the White Star Line, one of the great passenger lines, has just arrived at the home of Lord Peary, the manager of the Harland and Wolf shipyards, where all the White Star ships have been built. At the very same moment, in Jakobshaven, Greenland, the iceberg factory, where four-fifths of the annual 30,000 icebergs form, the weight of the snow bears down on the ice. The imprisoned air escapes. The whiteness disappears in favor of the metallic blue tint of packed ice. A servant enters with a dish of caviar on crushed ice. Dinner is served. Ismay and Piri talk of the swift canard line ships and the great German liners. How to beat the competition? A fire crackles away in the chimney. Suddenly, an idea. Ismay and Piri raise their glasses and toast one another. An enormous block breaks loose from the imposing cliff of ice that hangs over the Arctic Sea, slipping into the dark waters. An iceberg is born. As of that second, everything is determined. At the very moment the mere idea of the ship takes form, the mountain of ice that will destroy it starts a five-year-long trek towards their meeting place. The fate of so many men and women is sealed as of now. Sipping his coffee, puffing on his cigar, Ismay sketches ever so simply the plans for a gigantic transatlantic liner half again as big as all the others. The route between Europe and North America is so highly strategic that the companies wage war against one another to ravish the prize for the fastest crossing, the Blue Ribbon. Ismay's idea, not to try and build the fastest ship, but the most luxurious, with roomy cabins, a true floating palace, on time, reliable, safe, pure novelty. The iceberg moves through the sea, a majestic and gigantic mountain of fresh water floating on the salt water. And this one isn't even very big. Some are almost 400 yards, 360 meters long, over 300 feet, 100 meters high, and weigh up to 4 million tons. Perry and Ismay decide to build three of these giant liners. With such a trio of luxurious ships catering to a weekly crossing, they will be the masters of the North Atlantic. The iceberg has melted. Its shape has changed. It is half submerged. Only a few hundred icebergs have survived the 1,800 nautical miles to the shores of Newfoundland. Three years have already passed, and the long trip south still remains. Ismay scrolls the names of the ships beside his sketches. Olympic, Gigantic, and the biggest of the three, Titanic. The iceberg glides through the waters. Nine tenths of it are now submerged. Only the tip pokes through the surface, and a rather unimpressive tip at that. But this is destiny in motion. Inevitable doom moving ever closer, foot by foot, in the whimsical marine tides, in the solitude, while as they busy themselves with the construction of their machines, men play at being the masters of their lives. Five years later. Hot off the presses! The Monday, April 15th, 1912 issue has just come out! Clear skies this morning, but the weather will soon cloud over. A breeze from the south will bring us temperatures between 40 and 64 degrees this afternoon. Gentlemen, tonight you must turn your electricity on at 6.56 p.m. Baseball special! St. Louis blasts Chicago 4 to 1. Cincinnati wins over Pittsburgh 11 to 7. Come on, buy a paper to read how the good old boys from New York City are gonna cream Washington today. New York is really waking up from a splendid Sunday. 
Last night was the season's final show at the Metropolitan Opera, and the great Caruso himself sang Il Pagliacci, pure wonder. Wall Street is wonderful too, by the way. Last week's stock exchange results were this year's best, with 4,815,000 shares traded. And this week is starting off well, with 889,000 shares on the market, 177,000 of which just for the Steel Trust. Really, nobody can stop the country's increasing wealth. You glorify the Steel Trust, but they force the workers to toil on Sundays, and they turn them into indentured slaves. The wealth you talk about is only shared between a, a handful of Central Park families. This can't go on. Actually, while the upper crust gossip mongers kill their boredom by exchanging the latest rumors about Miss Anna Held, the famous music hall actress, who this Sunday asked to be divorced from her husband and agent, Mr. Florence Ziegfeld, it's the very symbol of your inconsiderate faith in progress through cold science that's going belly up. Everybody knows the so-called unsinkable liner Titanic has sent a distress call after striking an iceberg. Your dream's sinking like a rock. It might even be at the bottom of the ocean since nobody can even contact the Titanic's radios anymore. Banana oil. The White Star Line has just quelled those rumors. The atmospheric interference has scrambled the radio messages. It is not because we're out of touch that we must be alarmed. No news, good news. And Cape Race confirms this. All the passengers are safe and sound. The Titanic is being towed to Halifax. The White Star has chartered an express train to Halifax for the passengers' families. Too bad the arrival is no longer in New York. All the best people had set up parties and dinners in honor of the return of our friends from their European rest. Now everything is canceled. What a bore. Well, let's just make the best of it. After all, they will surely have a story to tell. If they make it back. The New York Times says there's loss of life. How you carry on. Your newspaper is the only one to be printing that. They're looking for cheap publicity, that's all. The Titanic is damaged, but it cannot sink. Besides, icebergs no longer sink ships nowadays. Take the Niagara. It's docked in New York with two holes in the hull, yet it did not sink because of that. So the Titanic, just imagine. The greatest naval architects and the best builders were at its cradle. The Titanic, the greatest of the three sisters born in Belfast, Ireland, in the Harland and Wolf shipyard. Everything in its conception is truly titanic. 15,000 workers labor in the yard. First of all, to build cradles to fit the leviathans. They each take up two berths, some 919 by 263 feet, with a height of over 230 feet. On March 31st, 1909, the Titanic's keel is laid, and the rest follows like an outsized wooden marble. 49-foot-high engines, beside which men resemble ants. A 15-and-a-half-ton anchor that must be drawn by 20 horses. A scaffolding like those used for skyscrapers, around which cranes work as though reaching up into the clouds. But even all the madness of the conception is nothing compared to the splendor of the ship's fittings, unbelievably luxurious. For the 700 first-class passengers, the Titanic offers luxury that has never before even been imagined. A gymnasium with electric camel and elephant, Turkish bath, swimming pool, racquetball court. The vessel's masterpiece is the candelabra, with its 21 branches that soars over the monumental staircase, floating above a splendid bronze angel. Stunning accommodations like the suites, made up of two sides, each boasting its own bedroom, wardrobe room, bathroom, water closet, living room, and individual entrance. All this linked by a shared sitting room and a glassed-in veranda looking out over the sea, complete with electric heating and wood fire chimney, and of course, private kitchen and servants' quarters. The rooms all have different interiors. Louis XVI, Louis XV, Empire, and the range of furniture is just as great. 50 different types of tables, 30 kinds of chairs. The interior decoration is perfected to the most minute detail. Just like the glassed-in promenades, the restaurant dining rooms with their silverware and fine china, the lounges, everything is pure luxury and sumptuous splendor. The trip will, however, cost no less than 800 pounds. 
In comparison, the workers from Harland and Wolf earn around three or four pounds for a six-day week, and that's good pay. Furthermore, first class actually shows a deficit, but it brings prestige and advertising. Second class is a revolution in itself. It was created a mere 10 years ago, and on the Titanic, it's been developed like never before. Not as lavish as first class, but a lot less expensive. Second class offers comfortable and beautiful rooms. The 700 second class passengers are treated to sober yet high quality furniture in rooms decorated in various styles. This is the category the White Star Line counts on to see the following years pay off as the early part of the century gives birth to a social class made up of merchants and self-employed men who more and more well-off now wish to profit from their leisure time and yearn for a certain luxury. The least spectacular revolution, yet the most important one, takes place in third class. For the first time, the Titanic brings these passengers bedrooms. And even though they are shared by several people, what an evolution compared to the steerage dormitories and their rows of cots. Furthermore, while the ticket is slightly more expensive than with the other lines, 12 pounds per crossing, or 66 times cheaper than first class, the Titanic feeds the travelers three meals a day. And in restaurants, if you please. Until then, third class passengers were supposed to bring along their own food for the entire crossing. For the first time, a ship allows third class passengers to travel in clean and decent conditions for a fair price. The thousand third class passengers even have their own lounges, smoking rooms, and promenade decks. The 900 crew members are divided between a privileged class and poor devils. While the handful of officers enjoy great comfort, or even luxury, like Captain Smith in his grandiose cabin, the bulk of the sailors and cabin boys, true proletarians of the sea, are packed away in conditions a lot less amenable than the third-class passengers. Maids, waiters, cooks, sailors, mechanics, electricians, gym teachers, errand boys. It's a true miniature city that thrives inside the biggest ship in the world. Endless days of work, bad wages, atrocious working conditions. The worst off are the stokers. Throughout the entire crossing, they never see the light of day. And a special corridor has even been set up for fear the passengers might catch a glimpse of their soot-covered faces. Every hour of the day, they must feed the cavernous boilers, shoveling in the 7,000 tons of coal required for each crossing. And it must be broken up by hand in the hellish heat and never-ending racket in the deepest reaches of the ship, below the waterline. That is the price paid to enable the important people to sip their brandy seven stories above the waves behind their vast bay windows. The papers in New York and the world over repeat this story endlessly till the launching of the Titanic, the unsinkable machine that man created to do away once and for all with the tribulations of the sea. 22 tons of soap are used to help the liner glide down into the ocean. Its cost, 1,500,000 pounds. The entire operation lasts but a minute. A worker, poor old James Dobbins, is killed on the spot. But on this day of May 31st, 1911, none of the 100,000 spectators realizes that he was just the first of the victims. No, now is a time for rejoicing. For the Union Jack to be hoisted, for the food to be brought on board, 37,000 bottles of water and wine, 57 tons of meat, fish, and poultry, 40,000 fresh eggs, thousands of crates of fresh vegetables for a five-day crossing. Crystal glasses, lace tablecloths, quality silverware, everything all the way to the third-class tableware is especially created for the Titanic. And then comes the incredible cargo that is brought on board. Cars, like the brand new 25 horsepower Renault. Motion picture cameras. A revolutionary airplane engine powered by steam. 
The Titanic's cargo holds are more than a treasure trove. They're a true cross-section of life. From the luxurious merchandise to the poor immigrant suitcase piled up next to raw materials and works of art. This is the post-Victorian era, the golden age. Never before have so many people been so rich. Even the poorest of the poor are starting to be better off. Everyone has faith in progress, ever bigger, ever better. All aspirations can be fulfilled and nothing can stop mankind's incredible surge forward. Machines only bring good things. Nobody imagines the mechanized horror that World War I will bring. Then New York is rocked by a news dispatch that will propel the world into the 20th century. The news comes in the night of Monday to Tuesday while New York City sleeps. Amidst the confusion of discrepant radio messages, in the rush of over-reassuring news, the tragedy can be guessed at. At 1 a.m., over 4,000 people gather in Times Square. Everybody's eyes are riveted on the gigantic blackboard looming high above the square. A young man's hand writes down the news of the day. The Titanic foundered. 1,400 could be lost. Silence seems to smother the square. Men cry in public. The rest of the city sleeps on, oblivious. Immediately, the growing crowd rushes towards the White Star Line offices. Everyone wants to know, to understand. How can this be? The impossible cannot have occurred. The city slowly wakes up to a day it believes to be like every other. Alone in their king-size beds, the rich are shaken by the newspaper headlines. The Titanic really did go down. Jam-packed in their unsanitary garrets, the immigrants hear the news by word of mouth. The rumor races along in every language. English, Italian, Irish, German, Russian, Swedish, Syrian, Chinese. The tragedy convulses the entire city. When young Vincent Astor, son of the powerful John Jacob Astor from Fifth Avenue, climbs the steps leading to the White Star Line, he's worried as to whether his father is alive or not. When he comes back out, stricken, hiding his tears behind his hands, the crowd is dumbstruck. No. The Astors are untouchable. A billionaire can't just drown. Is it true, then? It sank. But if even the Astors are affected, nobody's safe. Suddenly, a man, Mr. Hoyt, rushes out onto the porch. He looks down at the stunned and silent crowd, waiting to give vent to its pain. Oh, God, he yells, we're ruined. They're all lost. His words rock the whole world. The entire planet wakes up to face reality, flabbergasted. Each major city in the world has inhabitants among those who disappeared. And everybody has a relative, or at least knows of, some of the famous people who set off on this prestigious maiden voyage. Never before had so many condolences been exchanged. To honor the memory of the missing, of course, but also to mourn the faith in mankind and science that went down with the ship, as nature put man back in perspective. The Canard Line steamer, Carpathia, has rescued the Titanic survivors. The anxious crowd rushes to 24 State Street, to the Canard offices. Everybody wants to know whether their family members or friends have been saved. The telephone, Broad 3300, rings off the hook. The first lists are drawn up, incomplete, full of misspellings and mistakes. Orphaned relatives are given false hopes, whereas others, crushed with pain, will later learn of the miracle the number of survivors climbs from 675 to 855, goes back down, then up again. People's nerves shatter. Mr. Sumner, the canard manager, desperately tries to get in touch with the Carpathia. Unfortunately, his radio is not powerful enough. Worrying over the fate of his friend, Archie Butt, U.S. President William Howard Taft sends two Navy ships out, the Chester and the Salem, to establish a radio link and look for any additional survivors. At Lloyd's, as in all the other insurance companies, a wind of panic rises. All the insurance companies of Europe and America cannot cover the loss. 
nearly 17 million dollars, or three and a half million pounds. More than twice the enormous cost of the Titanic itself. The claims filed range from extravagant sums, 12 million dollars just for the diamonds, or the 600 thousand dollars a passenger wants for his wife's pearl necklace, to smaller things, William Carter's Renault, $5,000, or a photo signed by Garibaldi, $3,000, to outright strange items, Eugene Daly's bagpipes, $50, Stuart Collard's college classes, $50, Wilson's Arab costume, $5, or Edwina Trout's marmalade machine. There are so many flags at half-mast along Wall Street that one cannot make out the other end of the street. After all, over a dozen of the country's financial lords are lost in the wreckage, and they alone are worth some $200 million. As of 8 a.m., the White Star Line offices at 9 Broadway are swarmed, and by 10 o'clock, mounted police must move in to hold the crowd back. People will remain until the evening. As soon as the crowd spots the face of a White Star employee, the yelling starts. Liars! Why did you hold everything back? Inside, the people are jam-packed, lining up. Families and friends wait to question the employees. The din of questions, rumors, fears is drowned out by joyful yells and screams of despair. The telephone, Rector 2100, is constantly busy. In the room, the New York manager, Philip Franklin, is prey to an optimism bordering on madness or cruelty. He dares state that if the Carpathia has only found one-third of the passengers, it's because the others are on board the Parisian or the Virginian. Did they confirm over the radio? Luckily, no. And because we haven't contacted them, there's still hope. I'm sure they must have found people clinging to the ship's wreckage. But the water's ice cold. There are icebergs. That's it. The passengers who missed the lifeboats must have thought of climbing onto the icebergs. They'll all be saved. The saddest part is that to avoid the truth, to dare retain hope, people believe him. New York's most powerful private radio is located in John Wanamaker's department store. It's an advertising stunt with the operators out in the open and wearing headphones to entice the curious onlookers. But it's young David Sarnoff who runs the station and he manages to contact the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic. Therefore, the most exact news is to be heard at Wanamaker's. The Titanic really did go down at 12.47 in the night of Sunday to Monday after striking an iceberg. The sole survivors are on board the Carpathia, who we do not yet know. One name is on everybody's lips, Captain E.J. Smith. Everybody knows he went down with his ship, like a good captain ought to, People bring out an article from 1907, published in the days when he commanded the maiden voyage to New York of another White Star steamer, the Adriatic. What can I say of my 40 years at sea? I can only answer, not the slightest incident. Oh, of course, I've had my share of storms and fog, but I've never even seen the slightest accident. I never saw a wreck, never have been wrecked, nor even ever threatened with a wreck. You see, I've nothing worth writing a story about. If some frown at the irony in this quotation, another quote casts a chill throughout the city. Talking of the Olympic, Smith stated that if this ship were to strike a submerged object or an iceberg, which would rupture several of the watertight compartments, we would only have enough lifeboats for a third of the passengers. The Titanic is not better off. Such a forecast from such a man. Was this then unavoidable? If the powerful folks of the city have cancelled their excursions to the museums and the concerts, if the disappearance of so many wealthy industrial tycoons is paralyzing the country's economy, the news also rattles New York's poor districts. The poor and the immigrants gather in the movie theaters that the rich disdain. 300,000 tickets sold each day in New York alone. The silent movies attract all those who cannot speak English. The ticket costs a mere nickel. It's cheaper than going to the tavern. You can stay as long as you want. And in the dark room, the young men can flirt with the ladies. 
we're far from the chaperones of the small Sicilian or Polish villages. The news of the disaster races along in the score of languages spoken by New York's poor. Everybody knows a fellow countryman who is coming in on the Titanic. And all are hurt by this tragedy which could have just as easily carried them away. Ma what does this newspaper say? I, I don't know how to read English, me. What? You saying you can read Italian now? Come on, pups. I translate. Three anchors weighing ten tons each, a hundred ton rudder, three million rivets. From the keel to the upper bridge, the Titanic is tall as an eleven-story building that would be topped by four gigantic sixty-five-foot high chimney stacks, wide enough for two trains to pass without... They run a railroad through the Titanic? It's just an image, Pops. An image. Ah, I understand. That image, and not for real. I was saying to myself that they could never build such a ship. Already my cousin Lucchese cannot build a robot. Pops, it's already built. It sank without even ending its first crossing. But the white build it just to sink it. Oh, those English. We're organizing a strike. You in or what? You out of your mind? What you gonna get other than a black eye and losing your job? Not so. Take England last January. The miners all agreed to strike. They wanted a minimum wage. They hadn't even gone out yet when the Prime Minister, Asquith, met them to talk. To talk. And nothing else, right? Yeah, well, the talks failed. But they got their general strike. All the coal mines throughout the country closed. That's a victory in itself, huh? Finally united. Even the Titanic there that just went under, it was hurt by the strike. In March, all the ships had to go back to dock. There wasn't any coal left. After that, we won. Because for maybe the first time in the world, a general strike was resolved without the army or anything. On April 6th, the workers and the bosses came to an acceptable agreement. That way, since the Titanic was leaving barely a week later, they had to empty five of the White Star Line small steamers that were in the harbor and move all the coal onto the big liner. They also took everything that was on the Olympic to feed the Titanic's boilers. They'd have been better off not doing that, seeing where the coal went. If it were only the coal, any sailors were moved off other ships and onto the Titanic the night before it left. They'd never even seen it before. That mustn't have helped in the pandemonium during the wreck. It's also because of the strike that there was a lot of cargo on board. Since it was the first ship to sail for over a month, they piled everything they had on it. Yeah, there's even a book that went under. It should have left otherwise, but with all the delays, it wound up on the Titanic. A book? Who gives a hoot? Print another one. Wait a sec. I'm talking about the Rubia, Persian poem thing. It's a unique copy, a masterpiece of ancient Oriental literature, and it's completely covered in emeralds and precious stones. Must make it easy to turn the pages. Titanic or not, I think the workers are off to a bad start. Ford has just automated its production line. They, they put out a car every 93 seconds. They also invented an automatic ignition. No need for someone to crank start the cars anymore. That's the end of another job. He did good. Sinking with his old tub, Captain Smith did, because I heard that he was steaming like a maniac to get the blue ribbon. What's that? The award that goes to the ship doing the fastest crossing between Europe and New York. Then they're allowed to fly a blue pennant on the mast. And all the rich guys want to take the ship that won, so the company rakes in the dough. Wow, what stakes? Anyhow, that captain don't look really smart. The day the Titanic left, well, it hadn't even made it out of the harbor when he smashed into another boat, the New York. Hold your horses, that's not true. It's the Titanic's propellers. They're so powerful, they ripped the New York plum out of its mooring, and the eddies drew it straight into Smith's ship. Picture this. The Titanic weighs 46,000 tons, and the engines crank out over 50,000 horsepower. Yeah, maybe. Anyhow, nobody's gonna change my mind about Smith being responsible for that there accident. It's incredible what happened to that Titanic, sunk by an iceberg and all. I remember a poem my mother loved, over a hundred years old. It's by Celia Baxter, and it's about an iceberg that gently breaks off and floats towards the south. A ship sails towards it, which the iceberg sinks, while gently continuing its route. Yeah? Well, hold on. A short story just came out in Popular Magazine. The 
White Ghost of Disaster by Maine Blue Garnet. It's about a liner that's over 750 feet long and that sinks after hitting an iceberg. And half the passengers die because there's not enough lifeboats. They say the author dreamt of this story while traveling on the Olympic. Talk about a premonition. What about Morgan Robertson's book? It's even more incredible. It dates back to 1898. Yet everything in the book is just like what happened. Everything. The size, the displacement, the speed, the 3,000 beds on board, the 2,000 passengers on the maiden voyage, the lack of lifeboats, the iceberg ramming the starboard side, except the Titanic's for real, and Robertson's ships, the Titan. No! The worst is the title of the novel, Futility. Anyhow, you're Robertson. Well, he didn't experience it up close, because I remember a short story by William Thomas Steed, the head editor of the Review of Reviews, in which he tells the story of a liner, the Majestic, that is sunk by ice. So what? It ain't new. Did he say the ship was the biggest? Or was old Steed's story set on a maiden trip? No, it's just a moving story. Especially when you remember the Majestic belongs to the White Star Line. And that its captain was Smith. And also that William Steed just died on board the Titanic. Wow! Yes, he was coming to New York at the request of President Taft to speak at a conference about world peace. Steed went down with the ship without changing his calm and quiet manners. He remained till the end in the first-class lounge, reading ever so quietly amidst the wild commotion. Steed, so interested by spiritualism, and whom the mediums had often warned of the dangers he would face were he to travel by water, on screen, between Chaplin's short films, which entertain these men and women of all ages and nationalities, newsreels are broadcast. For once, on Tuesday evening in New York, the social gap is done away with. Rich and poor, men and women, young and old, Americans for several generations or immigrants fresh off the boat are all brought together by the tragedy. The parties and the debts are forgotten. Only hope remains, because everybody still hopes.
My husband is on board the Virginian. I'm sure of it. The churches, temples, and synagogues are full of burning candles. Lord, let my son be on the Parisian. And the prayers rise into the night. Let the Navy ships find my cousin. As soon as the city awakes, all of New York knows there is no longer any hope of finding more survivors. The Virginian and the Parisian have established radio contact. We arrived too late. No survivor on board. The only ones saved are the 700 on the Carpathia. Maybe they'll still find some lucky ones clinging to a table or to some wreckage. The radio kills any attempt at hope. The temperature of the sea and air are very low. Anybody drifting in the water is sure to have already died from the cold. As though the heavens themselves joined in the morning, the sun went into hiding at noon. A total eclipse. Everyone is bent on the only hope left. The person I love. My brother, sister, nephew. They must be on the Carpathia. It just can't be otherwise. The Navy cruisers transmit the first list of names from the Carpathia. Wanamaker's is no longer a department store, but a blend of mourning, Captain Smith killed my two sons, and joy, thank you my God for having spared my parents. David Sarnoff works the radio without a blink of sleep. He feels as though he's a messenger of death. With all hope gone, hatred and an urge for revenge appear. Aimed at whom? Who can be punished for the hundreds of dead? Captain Smith has disappeared. Where are the guilty parties? In Washington, D.C., the government is on the move. Five bills concerning maritime safety are brought before Congress, and an official committee is set up to conduct an inquiry into the reasons behind the wreck of the Titanic. Senator Smith is in charge. How can an unsinkable ship be sunk by an iceberg on its very first trip? It's outrageous. In New York, the families and friends press together on the White Star office's steps. Everybody wants in. Everybody wants to know who is on the Carpathia. What is sure is that Archie Butt, Taft's friend and emissary, is not on the Carpathia. He remained with the painter Francis Millet, passengers Clarence Moore and Arthur Ryerson, whose wife and three children were saved, playing cards in the first-class smoking room until the very end. People learn that their relatives are gone for good. How will we manage? We can't even bury them. You're even robbing us of a grave around which to gather. A White Star employee steps forward. Ladies and gentlemen, have no fear. The company is chartering a steamer to go and seek out the remains of your loved ones. And if we must spend weeks doing so, then we will. The Mackay Bennett, helmed by Captain Lardner, leaves Halifax, the hold filled with crushed ice for the corpses. On board, besides the cargo load of pine caskets, are an undertaker and a priest. The ship steams out for its morbid mission, bring back some dignity for the victims' families. The White Star office resembles the Tower of Babel. The families that have come to find out what happened to their relatives hail from all over the world. Many Americans, English, Irish, and Scots, of course, as well as the French, Belgians, and Swiss, who are from countries close to where the Titanic took on passengers. But all of Europe is there. Turkey, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Austria, Hungary, Denmark, and especially the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Norway, Sweden, which paid a high toll in lives. A few Russians and Croatians are present too, along with the many Bulgarians. The Americas were on the liner too, from north to south. Uruguayans, Peruvians, Mexicans, Cubans, Haitians, Canadians, and Asia too, 
Hong Kong, Japan, Thailand, along with the rest of the world, Australia, South Africa, Lebanon, and many Syrians. How come they traveled so far to board the Titanic in Southampton, Cherbourg, or Queenstown? Pure fate. The third-class passengers did not have tickets for the trip. At their local travel agencies, they bought a one-way pass to emigrate to the United States, and the agency was required to put them on the first ship leaving. Thus, after traveling by train and boat, they arrived the day the Titanic was leaving and climbed on board, thinking themselves lucky to enjoy the peak of comfort and modern technology. They could not imagine that they would never share that pleasure with their relatives. Many families of four or five people are thus cut down, sometimes even of eight or nine or eleven. Like Mr. and Mrs. John Sage and their nine children, ranging from four to twenty, leaving Peterborough in England, none will ever reach Jacksonville, Florida. Plain clothesmen suddenly cut through the crowd packed outside the White Star Line office. The Justice Department inspectors enter to ask about the false statements that were issued Monday by the White Star Line, stating that the Titanic was supposedly out of danger. Philip Franklin, manager of the New York White Star office, is questioned. Didn't you broadcast those radio messages on purpose, so you could have the time to take out more insurance to cover the cargo? Uh, of course not. We never... So it was only to enable you to sell as many shares as you could before the stock crashed? No, not at all. It was a tragic mistake, but an honest mistake. Between the serious messages and the hundreds of amateur radios, we got all mixed up. The airwaves were a real madhouse, and it was unthinkable that the Titanic... Then how come your Montreal office claims you sent them a message on Monday from New York stating that the Titanic had gone down with everybody on board. Actually, the White Star Line comes out clean from the inquiry, it being only guilty of mistakes and bad information. My God, look at that poor woman. She lost her son and daughter-in-law. They were honeymooning. What a tragedy. The worst part is that they'd still be alive if that Captain Lord had acted as a sailor. Captain Lord? Captain Stanley Lord is in charge of the freighter California. A little before 11 p.m. Sunday night, he asks his radio operator, Cyril Evans, to contact the Titanic. Hello, we are put up for the night, surrounded by ice. Evans is cut short. Get out, shut up. You're scrambling my signal. I'm communicating with Kate Race. Evans complies, then a little later, he turns the radio off and goes to bed. It's 11.30 p.m. At the same second, on board the Titanic, the tragedy begins. One hour later, when Californian's officer Herbert Stone sees white flares, he believes the Titanic is shooting fireworks. After all, he's used to seeing red flares in case of danger. But a true professional, he wakes Captain Lord and uses a Morse beacon to send messages towards the outline of the ship he glimpses on the horizon. No answer. Officer Groves goes down to check on the radio. Everything's quiet in the headphones. Unfortunately, Operator Evans is asleep and can't tell him that you have to crank up the signal detector. Groves leaves. It's 15 minutes past midnight. At that very instant, Ships that are further away, the La Provence, the Mount Temple, and the Iperanga, pick up the Titanic's CQD. CQD, come quickly danger, the father of the SOS. White rockets instead of red ones. No answer to the Morse beacon. Silent radio headphones. The Californian did not catch on to the tragedy that was occurring just a few miles away. Who knows? Could they have saved everybody? Or did the Titanic go down too fast? Whatever the case, Captain Lord will pay dearly for this horrid series of circumstances. In the large room of the White Star office, groups gather together. 
The families waiting for the sentence of the sea talked to one another, speaking of their loved one, telling how and why they were on board the Titanic. And there are the lucky ones, all those whose relatives canceled just before the ship sailed, or who got off at Cherbourg or Queenstown. Southampton, England, Wednesday, April 10th, 1912. The Titanic waits in the deep water dock specially built by the White Star Line. 7 a.m. Captain Edward John Smith bids his wife Eleanor and his 12-year-old daughter Helen goodbye before climbing into the waiting taxi cab. 8 a.m. The crew is accounted for. Some are missing. Replacements are hired amongst those waiting on the dock for their stroke of luck. Among the sailors, an imposter. The night before, he made the real sailor drink in order to steal his papers and to take his position on the ship. We will never know who he was. 9.30 a.m. On the dock, the second and third class train arrives from Waterloo Station, London. The second class passengers enter through sea deck. Edwina Celia Trout, ticket 34 218. Benjamin and Esther Hart and their seven-year-old daughter Eva, ticket 13 529. Charles Oldworth, the chauffeur of William Carter's 25-horsepower Renault. Father Thomas Roussel Bilesoff, off to celebrate his brother's wedding. Mr. Hoffman and his two sons. Mr. Hoffman is actually traveling under an assumed name. He split up with his wife and is really Mr. Navratil. He is abducting his children. Only the two boys, two and three years old, will survive. It will take some time before they are reunited with their mother. The third class passengers come in through the stern, many Scandinavians. The family of John Sage with the nine children, who has just purchased a citrus farm in Florida. Prize fighters Leslie Williams and David Bowen, off to trade blows in the United States. The third class passengers get lost in the maze of iron walled corridors. The children break free from their parents' hands. People come, people go, people desperately trying to find their cabins among the 300 divided among D, E, F, and G decks. 11.30 a.m., the first class train pulls to a stop. The journalists rush over to grab the celebrities. The officers and stewards wait on the gangway leading to the big entranceway on D deck. Here come Mr. and Mrs. Jacques Foutrel, the inventor of modern day crime novels. Colonel Gracie and his wife. Mr. and Mrs. Isidore Strauss and their servant, Ellen Bird. During the wreck, Ida Strauss will refuse to leave Isidore. We shall die as we have lived, together. Mr. Strauss is then asked to take place in a lifeboat with his wife. Seeing that he is not a young man, no one will object. No, I desire no favors that the other passengers do not receive. They settle themselves in their deck chairs and wait for the end to come, calm. Together. Later in New York, Mr. Strauss's testament is read. Ida, please, it is now time for you to think less of the others and a bit more about yourself. Enjoy life. Some 50 passengers cancel their trip at the last moment. The Fricks, because Mrs. Frick sprained her ankle. The millionaire Vanderbilt, obeying his mother, who does not trust maiden journeys. The owner of the White Star Line, John Pierpont Morgan, held up for business. 3 p.m., the monumental liner reaches the sea and sets off on her inaugural trip towards New York via Cherbourg, France, and Queenstown, Ireland. The carefree passengers are oblivious to the fact that down in the hold, a fire is blazing in coal bunker number six, ever since Belfast. Scores of stokers are tossing the burning embers into the boiler and hosing down the flames. The fire is under check, it will not spread. And in fact, this is a fairly ordinary event, no risk for the ship. 6.30 p.m., Cherbourg. Having come by train from Paris, 274 passengers board the Titanic from the tenders Traffic and Nomadic. A hundred Syrians, Croatians, and Armenians are alongside the rich Benjamin Guggenheim and Molly Brown, 
24 passengers are lucky enough to disembark. 8 p.m., the Titanic leaves the Bay of Cherbourg. Crossing the channel at night, it reaches Ireland at 11.30 a.m. on Thursday, April 11, 1912, anchoring some two miles from the harbor. 113 third class and seven second class passengers are ferried over on the tenders America and Ireland. Seven travelers go ashore. Among them is Francis Brown, seminarian and amateur photographer. One last man escapes the Titanic, hiding under the mailbags. John Coffey, 24 years old, a Queenstown boy who got himself hired in Southampton in order to get a free trip back home. 1.30 p.m. The port anchor goes up. The boilers let off steam. The propellers start to churn. When a black head pops out of the very top of the stern chimney, a soot-covered stoker is taking a breath of fresh air and a last look over green Ireland. The Titanic heads off into the Atlantic for New York. It didn't make it. And on Wednesday the 17th, in the White Star offices, they're still waiting for some news of their friends. Are they alive or dead? Suddenly, a rumor races through the room. The Carpathia is nearing the American coast. Every radio operator in the United States tries to contact the Canard Liner, and the airwaves are totally saturated. Specially equipped ships set to sea. On board are top-notch radio operators, journalists, photographers, and even some doctors specialized in mental disease there to help the survivors who might have gone mad because of the tragedy. But a heavy fog rises, preventing the ships from spotting the Carpathia. Suddenly, a reporter from the Globe, Winfield Thomas, on board another Canard Line steamer, the Franconia, gets the great news. The Carpathia is carrying 713 survivors all of them perfectly sane. The ship will reach New York late tomorrow night. Everyone will learn the truth of the matter. The Carpathia is expected in New York around 9 p.m. 200 uniformed police and scores of plainclothesmen are on duty. Nearly the entire NYPD is out. They block off all the streets around the pier. Since last night, nobody is allowed on Canard Line's Pier 54, where the Carpathia is to dock. While every paper in America wants to cover this incredible event, reporters are drastically screened. Very few obtain passes, which leads the New York Times to rent an entire floor of a hotel adjacent to the pier, setting up seven phones for its 16 newspapermen. The charitable societies are also out at work. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the YMCA, German, Irish, and Italian immigrant aid organizations. Volunteers prepare to bring comfort, and over 5,000 beds are set up for the survivors. Hospitals get ready too, and the mayor even sends two coroners and an undertaker. At the same time, donations are collected all over and pour in to help the third-class passengers. The entire city is in a state of shock. All of New York wishes to know who is alive, who is lost, and is Captain Smith really the one to blame? In the White Star Line building, close to the pier, Philip Franklin, the White Star Line's vice president, receives telegrams from Bruce Ismay. The U.S. Navy radio operators intercept three messages. Most desirable Titanic crew aboard Carpathia should be returned home earliest moment possible. Suggest you hold Cedric, sailing her daylight Friday, unless you see reason contrary. Propose returning in her myself. Please send outfit of clothes, including shoes, for me to Cedric. Have nothing of my own. Please reply. Very important, you should hold Cedric daylight Friday for Titanic crew. Answer. Think most unwise to keep Titanic crew until Saturday. Strongly urge detaining Cedric, sailing her midnight if desirable. The three notes are signed Yamsi, the coded signature Ismay uses for his personal and private messages. The Americans realize he's getting ready to skip to England. Senator William Alden Smith, the head of the U.S. Senate's inquiry, decides to leave Washington for New York City. 
But does he have the power to arrest British subjects? President Taft himself confirms his right to do so. After all, if the radio operator never answered the president's personal messages inquiring into whether his friend and aide-de-camp Archie Butt was alive or dead, it can only be because Ismay is censoring the Americans. At the southernmost tip of Manhattan, in the rain, people crowd to see the Carpathia go by. There will be 10,000. Rumors race through the crowd. Captain Smith's career is devoid of the slightest accident. Besides, it is said that the incident involving the New York was not caused by Smith. On the contrary, thanks to his experience, he handled the Titanic so well he avoided a seemingly inevitable collision. It's Ismay, for sure, who forced Smith to go flat out to obtain the fastest crossing and win the coveted Blue Ribbon. It must also be Ismay who spread the false good news in order to prevent his company from going belly up. By the way, how come he's alive? If anybody should have sacrificed himself, he's the one. Captain Smith, he went down with the Titanic. On Canard Line's Pier 54, where the Carpathia is to dock, policemen set up ropes, dividing up the pier into alphabetical sections. Green lanterns dangle from the ropes, shining in the drizzle as night falls. The first spectators arrive around 6 p.m., very few at first. Then, around 7 p.m., there are 200, 600 at 8 p.m., and after that, things go wild. Between 8 and 9 p.m., 30,000 people crowd the pier. The river's estuary is choppy, with a strong east wind and a light fog. Over 50 little boats await the liner. There are tugs, ferries, yachts, all filled with newspapermen and onlookers. The mayor himself is there, with a party of officials. Suddenly, at 8.30 p.m., a dark shape looms out of the fog. The shadow slowly swivels around, and the Carpathia's single stack is spotted. With the Statue of Liberty in the background, the mayor's tug whistles, and all the ships in the harbor join the concert, whistling and tolling their bells. Immediately, the crowd of over 40,000 yells out, and as though God were once again adding his personal touch, pouring rain starts to fall, and a storm erupts. The pitch black night is shaken by thunderclaps and lightning. The ships surround the Carpathia. The photographer's ceaseless flashes mix with God's lightning, and even the bellowing thunder cannot drown out the questions blaring from the megaphones. The Carpathia slowly moves forward. She stops to take the pilot on board, and the reporters try to climb onto the ship. The Carpathia's officer, Reese, must yank the pilot aboard and even punch a newspaper man in the chin to make him climb back down. Another journalist chews on soap to start frothing like a madman, yelling that his sister is on board. Pushed back, he offers $100, $200, no use. The Carpathia finally slips away. Still, one reporter does manage to climb aboard. Captain Rostron spots him and has him swear to stay on the bridge and not go below decks to see the passengers. The man will remain true to his word. The Titanic's survivors appear at the railing. The photographers shoot like mad. The newspaper men call out to them. The Titanic's sailors are amongst them. Reporters offer them $50 to leap overboard and swim to the tugs. No deal. One ice water bath was enough. Suddenly, the Carpathia reaches the Canard Pier and a deadly silence settles in, cutting off even the most rash of the newspaper men. But the liner steams by without letting up. Amazement, the Carpathia moves up to the White Star Line's pier and stops. Lightning bolts crisscross the night, illuminating the sailors who lower the Titanic's lifeboats, the sole remnants of the great liner. Then the Carpathia comes back in the continuing silence, the first sobs are heard as the ship's lines are cast. The gangplanks are lowered. It is 9.15 p.m. A cry wells up. Here they come!
The crowd waits, illuminated by powerful spotlights, so the survivors can make out their families. There, the first passengers are coming off, but disappointment is immediately heard. They're the Carpathia's passengers. Soon, none are left. Then, a young woman appears, hatless, with mussed up hair. She hesitates, scans the crowd, before stepping down to be greeted by a rush of newspaper men. She is the first survivor. People scream out in joy or sorrow. They fight to get a glimpse. Pandemonium breaks out. With that, the Salvation Army's band starts to play. Famished, emaciated, worn out, with both feet frostbitten, Harold Bride, the Titanic's second Marconi radio operator, is still sending Morse messages despite the Carpathia's safe arrival. The inventor of the wireless himself, Guglielmo Marconi, appears with Jim Spears of the New York Times. But Bride does not even look up. Rooted in front of his radio set, a small blue flame dancing under his fingers, he only has eyes for his duty. No need sending that anymore, my boy, says Marconi. Bride swivels around, recognizing the famed inventor. Mr. Marconi, Phillips is dead. He's gone. Pulling out his notepad, Jim Spears steps forward. Can you tell us about that? I woke up a bit before midnight to fill in for Phillips, my colleague. Seeing how exhausted he was, I immediately replaced him without changing out of my pajamas. That's when the captain came in. We've hit an iceberg, he said. I'm going to inspect the damage. Get ready to send a distress call if I tell you to. We hadn't felt the impact. It's funny that such a disaster didn't even shake the ship. And we were lucky. The radio had broken down, and we just spent all day repairing it, successfully. Otherwise, nobody would have come to save the lifeboats. Captain Smith returned ten minutes later. Already we heard a heck of a hubbub outside. Send an international distress signal, he told us. And Philip started sending a CQD. We laughed about it, not taking things very seriously. The captain was back five minutes later. What are you sending? As a joke, I said we could send an SOS. That's the new signal. It might be our last chance to use it. We all laughed. We connected with the Carpathia. She changed bearing to come to help us. I left to warn the captain. The decks were crowded with men and women. Total chaos. Distress flares were being sent. It was obvious that the Titanic was tilted forward. I saw that women and children were being made to climb into the lifeboats. Back in our cabin, Phillips pointed out that I was still in my pajamas. I got dressed. The captain came to tell me that water was rising in the engine rooms and that the dynamo feeding the radio would soon be submerged. Already our messages were getting weak. I went back out. The ship was listing very sharply, with the water very close to the deck. I saw a lifeboat being put to sea, number 14, I believe. There were about 60 people. I saw Mr. Brown bidding his wife and daughter, Edith, farewell. I asked him what time it was. His watch showed 1.30 a.m. Suddenly, some passengers jumped forward to leap into the boat. Officer Lowe fired three shots. That sure cooled them down. This made me go look for something that would float for Phillips and me. I came by the steel baron, Mr. Benjamin Guggenheim. He was leaving the deck with his butler, to whom he said, let us go get dressed. I would want my wife to know I died a gentleman. I pulled a jacket on, my boots and a second jacket. Then I helped Phillips with his boots, coat and jacket. Phillips never stopped sending messages, not even for a second. The captain came in, carrying his megaphone. He told us that it was over. You have done your duty. I'm setting you free. Now it's every man for himself. The captain left to announce the news on the sinking deck. The ship was at a terrible angle. It was 2.05 a.m. Despite the captain's order, Phillips keeps on sending messages. I step into the room to get his stuff, and as I step back out, I see a stoker pulling Phillips' life jacket off. Phillips was so engrossed in his work that he didn't even realize what was going on. I threw myself at the stoker and sure hope I killed the scoundrel. Phillips and I went out onto the bridge. The band was playing a ragtime tune. To my great surprise, a collapsible boat remained. People were trying to get it off the ship. There was no sailor among them. So I went to help when a wave struck the deck. By reflex, I grabbed hold of the lifeboat and was swept overboard with it. I found myself underwater, beneath the lifeboat, which was crushing me. 
I dove, managed to get free, and realized that the sea was covered with hundreds of people floating in their life jackets. The Titanic, she was beautiful. Smoke and sparks flew out of the stack, and the ship's bow was sinking like a duck. During all that time, the band kept playing. We heard autumn. Then the ship went vertical and sank in one slow and gentle move, without even a ripple. I was shaking from the cold. I spied a lifeboat nearby and started swimming like mad. I was wiped out. I felt myself go under when a hand took hold of me and I was pulled on board the collapsible boat with which I had been washed overboard. It was still upside down and the sides were not well set up. We were perched on precarious safety, but salutary safety, since all around us it was sheer hell. People were drowning in the icy waters, unable to swim. Someone said we should pray, so on our waterlogged hull, Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterians, all together we said the Lord's Prayer. There was but one woman on board, Rosa Abbott, a third-class passenger, and the tennis champion, Norris Williams. Then a lifeboat came to our rescue, even though it was already filled to the gills. Afar, I spotted a ship's lights, and knew the Carpathia was coming, and that we were saved. Harold Bride remained at his post to keep on sending messages. He only left the Carpathia the following morning, both legs frostbitten and crushed. The stewards disembark a jam-packed canvas bag. The reporters rush towards it. They say it's the only luggage left from the Titanic. It bears the letter G. The owner appears, Mr. Samuel Goldenberg. He explains that he bought it on board the Carpathia to carry his and his wife's clothes. How did you manage to reach the Carpathia? Queries a journalist. A little before 1 a.m., my wife Edvija and myself managed to leave in lifeboat number five on starboard up front near the first class entrance. First, the women and children got in. There was Miss Marguerite Froelicher, a first class passenger like us. Mr. Ismay helped them on board. Then, seeing as no women were left, Mr. Pittman, the officer, allowed the men to climb in. Myself, of course, and the tennis player, you know, the famous uh, Bear, Carl Bear, as well as Mr. and Mrs. Beckwith and their daughter, Helen Newsom. They started lowering the lifeboat towards the sea, very slowly. Mr. Ismay was jumping around like a lunatic, waving his arms, yelling, faster, faster, Another officer, Mr. Lowe, told him to get lost. If you'd be kind enough to get out of here, I might be able to do something. You want me to hurry up? You'll end up making me drown the whole bunch. My wife thought the officer would be dismissed. I mean, rebuking the big boss. But this may seem broken and just left. That's when Dr. Frauenthal, a first-class passenger, leapt into the lifeboat to be with his wife. His brother followed suit. They fell on poor Mrs. Stengel, shattering two of her ribs and knocking her cold. We were 41 on board. We rowed away from the ship. On the Titanic, as it got later, more and more people crowded around the lifeboats. In the end, the crew had to link arms to stop the people from climbing in. Flares exploded in the sky, illuminating men leaping into the lifeboats already at sea. Only the stern was still out of the water. People were massed up there. A priest, Father Biles, was giving absolution to a hundred faithful, and the band played, Nearer My God to Thee. Suddenly, around 2.30 a.m., the smokestacks fell, and the lights went out, came back on again, and we saw that the stern had risen out of the water nearly at a right angle to the sea. It remained like that, frozen, for a few seconds. Then everything went out and it sank in one go. The ocean resounded with one long, horrid scream. Officer Pittman turned back to save people, but some women begged him not to for fear the lifeboat would overturn. A half an hour later, at 3 a.m., when the sea had become silent once again, we tied up to lifeboat number seven and waited until dawn. We found the Carpathia on its way to save us just after 5 a.m. The first survivors had been on deck for an hour or so. We wrapped ourselves in blankets and were served tea, coffee, soup, all that without a word, without a sound. Our grief was contained. Ismay was in a state of shock. 
He locked himself up in the cabin of the Carpathia's doctor. The last survivor to climb on board was the Titanic's second officer, Lightoller. All in all, we were 705. 1,523 people had been lost. Seeing as the first and second classes were less than half full, and the third class just over two-thirds, well, there had been room for over a thousand more victims. Just think of it. The Carpathia went back to look for more survivors. In vain. Just a single body. So Captain Rostron brought the flag to half-mast. And mass was held over the wreck site. We all broke down. There were tears in both the men and women's eyes. A service was held for the people who didn't survive on board and who were buried at sea. Like that poor young sailor, Lyons. May he rest in peace. Then we collapsed where we could while the Carpathia steamed towards New York. I organized a fundraiser for the Carpathia sailors. Dr. Fraun Paul was the treasurer. Molly Brown donated a lot. But my wife is exhausted and so am I. Please excuse me, gentlemen. Bruce Ismay remains holed up in the ship's doctor's cabin. The White Star Line's vice president, Philip Franklin, comes to see him. He barely has enough time to warn him that things seem to be setting off on a bad path when the door opens, revealing a man in a long gray overcoat and a derby hat, Senator Smith. The senator states that he's come to serve papers on Bruce Ismay, who is to remain in the United States and appear as a witness before the Senate inquiry. Finally, the survivors leave the ship. Many are not well-dressed, wearing only such clothes as they were able to borrow on the Carpathia. But they are greeted with screams of joy and tears of happiness that come as a counterpoint to the lamentations of those learning the certainty of a relative's demise. Unfortunately, for each opportunity for joy, there are two opportunities for sorrow. The first-class passengers come first, even now. His subpoena in hand, Bruce Ismay leaves for the Ritz. Mrs. John Jacob Astor is greeted by Vincent Astor, a nurse, and two doctors. They leave by limousine for their Fifth Avenue mansion. As Major Arthur Peuchen leaves for the Waldorf Astoria, he realizes he's lost his wallet. Not to worry, they will surely let him pay later. Others leave the city like Mrs. Charles Hayes in her own private train. It's not the same for the third-class passengers, who can only disembark around 11 p.m. The newspaper men did not care about them. They've lost all their belongings in the wreck. But the public and private welfare organizations are there. Those who have friends or family in the city may land without any paperwork. The others are screened by seven immigration officers. They're the only legal immigrants to avoid Ellis Island. In the pandemonium, some women lie and head into New York alone, widowed, penniless, without any idea of where to go, without even speaking the language. After all the passengers have disembarked, to the joy of some and the despair of others, the 40,000-person crowd slowly disperses. Only the most desperate linger on, along with the last reporters. Then nobody is left. At midnight, while the rich are in their big hotels or their luxurious homes, and the poor in their dormitories, the only souls left on the Carpathia are her sailors and the surviving Titanic seamen. The rescued sailors are taken off through the stern and ferried to customs in a small ship before spending the night in the third-class bunks of the Lapland. April 18, 1912 draws to a close. On the White Star Line pier, the lifeboats are looted by souvenir hunters. Friday, April 19th, the Senate Committee gathers in the East Room of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel for its inquiry. The ballroom, 
with its lavishly decorated walls, the wood panels and the crystal chandeliers, is emptied of all furniture. A large conference table is set up, and chairs are lined up against the walls. The doors open at 9 a.m. sharp, letting the spectators surge in. All of New York's upper crust has turned out to enjoy the show. In a few seconds, not one seat remains vacant. Amidst the well-to-do crowd, one can spot a few worried and tired faces of poorly dressed people. The families of the victims have come to learn, to understand what happened. At 10 a.m. on the dot, Senator Smith enters with the other members of the inquiry board. The session opens. Amidst the crowd of the idle, rich spectators and the little people directly affected by the tragedy, a mysterious character makes his way. Who is this character acting so strangely? Why does he eavesdrop here and there? He's Sheriff Joe Bayless from Michigan. This good friend of Senator Smith's has been asked to discreetly listen in on the crew members and the gossip in order to bring the information back to the senator. Senator William Alden Smith, a Republican from Michigan, is a fierce opponent of the trusts in general and of J.P. Morgan in particular. Morgan, the owner of the White Star Line, among other holdings. Therefore, Smith's inquiry will have a personal side to it, but the senator knows how to remain objective, and his goal is not so much to try the White Star Line as it is to prove that someone has to be responsible. Even though the ship went down in international waters, and although she was flying the Union Jack, the senator bases himself on a law of 1898 that says one can sue the owners if they were guilty of misconduct. This is also the crusade of a certain America, which at that time is socially more advanced than a certain England, still caught up in its highly Victorian conventions and inequalities. Smith cannot let this crime go unpunished. Above all, he wants to ensure that the dead did not die entirely in vain, and he wants to use this inquiry to make new laws, rendering another such accident impossible. Since the whole country, indeed most of the world, is intent on each and every word that is to be said during the inquiry, Senator Smith wants everything to go public right away. Therefore, the newspaper men surround the table ready to take their notes. Of course, they have conflicting views. Some see Ismay as tough as a German with his big mustache, others as so very oriental with his curly hair and swarthy skin, or else a true British aristocrat, which for the average American in those days is the worst insult. Anyhow, as Ismay rises to testify, the cameras flash and Smith orders the photographers out. But they're already running to have their pictures published. Of course, Bruce Ismay is the first person to testify, and the one everybody's waiting to hear, having already stamped him as guilty. His dry smile, the way he cannot stop rubbing his mustache, the large diamond on his pinky, everything is against him. He talks of the wreck and wards off the many accusations. No, I did not choose the people who were with me in the lifeboat. No, the Titanic was not going for the Blue Ribbon. Anyhow, it never could have competed with the Mauritanians' top speed. No, I did not slip into the lifeboat like a thief. There were no more women on the deck when I left. But then, how come so many women perished? Where were they? And other answers failed to clear away the doubts. Ismay states that the 45 people in his lifeboat filled it to capacity. That there were more lifeboats than required by British law that there was no censorship of President Taft's telegram. And if Ismay tried to retain the Cedric to go back to England, it wasn't for me, but so the sailors, who have lost all their money and clothes, can be reunited with their families, who must be worrying to death. He also tries to put the blame on Captain Smith, stating that the Titanic was a sturdy ship. Maybe the most sturdy of all ships. <laughs> That's for sure. It's even unsinkable, quips a sailor. And had we steamed head-on into the iceberg, none of this would have happened. That's modern seamanship. When in doubt, ram the obstacle. Senator Smith is unable to pin anything on Ismay, not even that Ismay put pressure on Captain Smith to increase speed. But if Ismay seems more efficient than the Americans thought, 
Some explaining remains to be done. Charles Herbert Lightoller, the highest ranking officer to have survived, starts out by charming everyone with his melodious voice and his intelligent and professional speech. But little by little, Smith realizes Lightoller actually avoids the questions, craftily eluding the true answers. So, the senator starts to take the officer apart, questioning him for three hours, pinpointing several discrepancies, among which an important one. The Titanic's officers had not heard of the tests conducted on lifeboats and thought that while they could hold 65 people at sea, they could not be hoisted down the side with that many people for fear of breaking in two or snapping the ropes. This judgmental error and communication problem killed 400 people. Nor can Lightoller explain why 216 crew members escaped in place of the passengers when they should have only been two per lifeboat. All I can say is that on my side of the ship, there were only two or three per boat. Neither can he remember seeing people floating in the water or trying to climb onto the lifeboats. Furthermore, Lightholo tries to explain that they did not know there were icebergs in the area. But he must withdraw his testimony when Senator Smith shows him the copies of telegrams sent by various ships to the Titanic. Anyhow, Lightholer obstinately refuses to tell what the officers knew about the icebergs or what precautions were taken. What to make of his forgetfulness, the desire to cover for his captain, the wish to help the White Star Line and his own career, the mistrust of the hostile atmosphere felt in America. Who knows? The Carpathia's captain, Arthur Henry Rostron, is the hero of the day, maybe even the true hero of the whole story explaining that it is by a stroke of luck that his men heard the SOS because the operator was about to close down for the night, he tells how he did not hesitate one second before rushing to the Titanic's rescue, preparing everything down to the slightest detail. I designated the beds in which to lay down the survivors and who should take care of them. I doubled the lookouts and had the first aid kits brought onto the deck. I had bags prepared to hoist the children on board and I even, well, I even had sturdy chairs set up with ropes in order to tie down the survivors the wreck might have made insane. But if Rostron moves everyone, even Senator Smith, to tears as he talks of how the survivors appeared and of the mass he celebrated, he also is adamant that the lifeboats could have easily carried 70 people, far from Ismay's 45. In the meantime, in England, the entire country mourns the passengers lost, the sailors ravished by the sea, and Captain Smith, who died doing his duty. Friday, St. Paul's Cathedral, London. Thousands of people fill the nave, pouring out into the nearby streets where thousands of others stand, a memorial mass is celebrated for the lost souls. In the crowd are family members of the survivors who are not even sure if their relatives are alive or dead. So many contradictory messages have they received. There also are the friends of the missing, desperately clinging to empty hopes until the other sailors return. The ceremony ends with a hymn, O oh God, our help in ages past, and the chorus reverberates under the vault. Oh, hear us when we implore you for those threatened by the sea. Nobody yet knew that the very same words had ended the divine service on board the Titanic Sunday night, just before the tragedy. In New York, when evening comes, Senator Smith makes a crucial decision to retain the English witnesses in the United States, since if they leave, the Americans will never manage to make them return. The lawyers counterattack, explaining that the White Star Line will not pay for 200 sailors to remain in New York for long. So Smith pulls out the list Sheriff Joe Bayless gave him and subpoenas some 30 of the Titanic's crew members. The others can leave. Bayless spends the night finding the men and bringing them in to appear the next morning so the inquiry may continue. 
Saturday, the crowd gathers once again at the Waldorf Astoria as the inquiry continues in a bigger hall, the Myrtle Room. It's ironic that this room, one of the favorite high society function halls, be chosen to hold what is, in a way, the trial of a period built on social gaps. It is Harold Bride's day. The 22-year-old Englishman, who graduated from telegraph school barely 10 months ago, is called to testify and appears as the living illustration of all the tragedy's horror. Seated in a wheelchair, exhausted, with his creased face resting on a pillow, his jaw dangling and his left foot still in bandages, the room is so crowded he has to be carried in over the spectators. The audience is silent, overcome with admiration and compassion. Everybody hangs on Senator Smith's words when he questions Bride about the existence of telegrams warning of icebergs. And Bride answers that it is true. Yes, telegrams warning of ice fields were handed to Captain Smith Sunday afternoon. The crowd stares at Ismay and Lightholder. So they knew. Bride keeps on answering the questions, even though he's getting more and more tired. In the end, the senator asks whether he escaped the Titanic on the overturned lifeboat with Lightholder. Yes, Bride answers. I'm the last person they invited on board. What do you mean, the last person invited? Asks Smith. Do you mean that there were several of you? Of course, there were people all over. There were scores of us trying to climb onto the raft. Again, the room stares at light on her. Senator Smith starts to shed tears, and women moan. They start to comprehend the extent of the disaster. But if Lightholder lied about the icebergs, about there not being anybody in the sea near his lifeboat, what about his statement that he did not give priority to the crew members? Bride answers. Oh, we were nearly only employees on board. Out of 30, there must have been only three or, or four passengers. Smith thanks Bride for his courage and candor and suspends the session, stating that it will resume in Washington, D.C. Then, Senator Smith asks Sheriff Bayless about the Lapland. Is it already sailing back to England? Yes, answers the sheriff, but it can't be very far. Joe, have the Lapland stopped. I want you to bring me more of the Titanic sailors to testify. There's something in the wind and I want to find out what it is. I've barely begun to work the lid off this case. Everything is still to be done. Smith orders Ismay, Franklin, Lightholder, and the three other surviving officers to come to Washington, as well as 30-odd sailors. Joe Bayless succeeds in getting on board the Lapland and comes back with five more witnesses. Otherwise, on the Lapland, finally out at sea, the other surviving British sailors are headed to England. Fleet, he told me everything. Like he was only 20 minutes away from hitting the sack when... It is 20 to midnight, when the young Frederick Fleet, up in the crow's nest, peering out into the starry night, suddenly spots a dark shape right in the Titanic's path. Ice dead ahead, he yells, tolling the bell. He grabs the telephone and rings the bridge. What's happening, queries Officer Moody. The answer comes over the telephone. Iceberg dead ahead. Thank you, answers Moody, who hangs up. The reaction is immediate. The engines are reversed, and the ship swerves to avoid the obstacle. The Titanic seems to take an hour to turn a little. In fact, it takes a mere 10 seconds. Fleet sees the iceberg touch the ship, pour a ton of ice onto the forward deck, then slide along the ship's flank with a tearing sound before disappearing into the night. All this in just a few seconds. Well, oh my, oh my, that was a close call, sighs Fleet, leave. Yeah, well me, I say it ain't normal they didn't have no binoculars up there. That's right. Lightholder, he says that if he gives you some, you just keep your eyes glued to him and you don't look all around. Is that so? Has he been up there in the crow's nest even once? Because on a clear starry night, you can see twice as far with the binoculars. You know what? I don't even realise today that we ran that float in ice cube. I didn't feel a thing. Well, you're lucky. Because me, I was up front on B-Deck and I saw the thing coming straight at us and I heard this deadly racket. The passengers came out, but I calmed them down. One of them even wanted me to put some of the iceberg in his whiskey. What a waste! <laughs> hey, Wallace, down on D-Deck, underneath. 
talk about a waste. It was a hell of a waste. We took a big blow and even went flying out of our beds. We pulled our clothes on, but we weren't even able to make it down to our post, seeing as there was all this water bubbling up the ladder, and it was rising mighty fast. Yeah. Well, the one that suffered most was... The Titanic. <laughs> For sure. But no, I was talking of Barrett. Frederick Barrett is at work, feeding the starving boilers in room number six, when the alarm goes off and the red light comes on. Just then, a blow is felt, and green seawater surges into the hold through a tear running along the entire length of the room, a foot and a half above the floor. Barrett and the others barely have enough time to leap towards the watertight door that slams behind them. The lights go out. In the light of the electric lamps, Barrett and some 15 men try to empty the boilers in room number five, when a wave washes through the room. Barrett and his men escape up the stairs as the water gushes up after them. I'm telling you that those fat cats there in their obnobbing dinner, instead of pigging it, they should have been picking their brains. How about you? Do you think you have a brain? Look who's speaking. Anyhow, if they'd made their so-called watertight compartments a bit higher, well, the tub wouldn't have sunk. And if they'd have put a few more lifeboats on board, we could have saved everyone. Where'd you get that idea? The officers are a bunch of morons. The way things went, they weren't even able to get all the lifeboats overboard. So, even if we'd had three times as many, it would have been useless. Other than having us paint and clean the damn things, as though we don't have better stuff to do. Go on, lads. All this is a lot of hodge crook. Hey. It is. Because let me tell you, it's whole number at Harland and Wolf's, the Titanic's. It was 390904. So what? What do I care? You can stuff your chair. Look at 390904 in the mirror. It makes N-O-P-O-P-E, -E, meaning no Pope. You see, the anti-Pope. So it was done for from the start. God struck down the blasphemers. But why look at it in a mirror? Because it's the Antichrist, dimwit. It's true that it was done for from the start, but not because of that. My sister. You've got a sister? Why didn't you say so before? Where's she at? Leave my sister be. You wouldn't even know what to do with her. Anyhow, I was saying that my sister, she looked into the Titanic's astrological chart for the day it was pushed into the sea. Well, she came up with danger on or near water, accidents during travel, sadness, and loss of family. But then, how come you left on the ship? You nuts or what? No, it's just that my sister, she's always been wrong in her predictions. Yeah, well, in the meantime, what's eating me up is that they cut off our salary at 2.30 a.m. just after she went down. We nearly drowned before having to row on the icy sea, and we don't even get a penny. So long as you do not contribute to the White Star Line, the company owes you nothing at all, is what they told me. What kills me is the rigmarole with the Californian, because they have to have their scapegoat. They can't understand that it was just a stroke of bad luck, a whole bunch of little problems, slip-ups that turned into a major tragedy. So, seeing as they can't say it went down because of this or that, they're going to pin it all on the Californian and Captain Lord. They're going to say that if only he'd have done something, nobody would have drowned. Well, it's kind of true. True? Come off it. He couldn't have. Listen up. Officer Boxall says he saw a small ship five miles away that moved and left. The guys on the Californian, they say they saw a small ship five miles away that moved and left. The Californian called out with its morse lamp, no answer. While on the Titanic, well, they were signalling like mad. Don't you think they'd have seen one another? Huh? And don't it strike you as strange that neither of them rust buckets moved? And then, in the morning, the Californian finds out the Titanic went down ten miles away. Five and five makes ten. It's as clear as a miser's coffee. There was another ship between the Titanic and the Californian. And when the Californian saw the flares behind the mystery ship, it signalled and got no answer, seeing as it wasn't the Titanic. Huh? Impossible. They wouldn't have pulled out of there and let the Titanic go down. No sailor in the world would have done that. Oh, yeah. Not even a captain who doesn't feel like pulling into the harbour with survivors sprawled out all over his bales of opium or bootleg tobacco. Not even a captain with a boat full of sailors running from the law and who aren't too keen on winding up on the front page of the paper. Don't worry, my boy. Nobody's going to come up and confess to prove I'm right. An old man lord, they'll say he's a coward if he says what I just told you. He makes me laugh, that Senator Smith with his inquiry. 
Are you Mr. Ismay? Please have some more tea. What's for sure is that he ain't talking to the only ones who suffered, the poor and the workers. 36 engineers had the engines running until three minutes before the Titanic went under and not one survived. 84 stokers had to go back down after they'd escaped the rising water. So the engines don't stop. In the end, only eight made it out. And the postman? All five drowned to try and save the rich people's mail. You're forgetting the third class passengers. The three quarters of them died, locked up in the lower decks. No, not locked up. I was there. The women wouldn't follow me out onto the bridge. They were panicking. They wouldn't leave their husbands. A lot didn't understand English, and it's a real maze down there. Okay, but still, some doors stayed locked. True, true. By mistake. It's because of the American law that requires that third class people be contained to avoid spreading contagious diseases. Senator Smith pursued the Senate inquiry in Washington, D.C., taking the witnesses along with him and calling upon many experts. He was unable to prove criminal guilt, yet his conclusion was harsh. Built at great expense by an illustrious company whose reputation alone replaced the engine and lifeboat tests, the Titanic went to sea without any preparation whatsoever. This indifference in the face of danger, this self-confidence bordering on vanity, also turned out to be Captain Smith's mistake. He paid no attention to the falling temperature, nor to the iceberg warnings, simply letting the liner speed into the ice fields. And after the collision, under the pretense of calming the passengers down, they were hoodwinked. Imagine the distress of the third-class passengers, the first to see the water well up in their cabins, the first to perceive the liner's sharp list, and the last to benefit from the lifeboats, filled in such confusion and such a total lack of planning that they left half empty. Let us only pray that this tragedy gives birth to a new era of vigilance and that the generations to come will be protected by new laws. These laws were passed. While the over 300 bodies retrieved by the Mackay Bennett are brought back to be identified and buried in Halifax, while memorials are erected throughout the world to honor the dead, be they famous people or just simple loved ones, minds are changing and new regulations are set up still valid today. Fines for companies that do not comply with safety rules. Strict laws concerning life jackets, life boats, water pumps. Radios that must be on 24 hours a day. Eight hour work days for the sailors. An ice patrol to keep watch over the iceberg route. The ice patrol would give birth to the American Coast Guard which every April 15th deposits a reef at 41 degrees 46 minutes north by 50 degrees 14 minutes west, the historic coordinates of the spot where lies the wreck of the most sadly notorious liner in the world. In New York, in April 1912, people worry about the Titanic's notorious watertight compartments, not really understanding that they're only used to stop the water from rising and that they were ripped open during the wreck. The people believe that some survivors might have found refuge in them. They would then be trapped at the bottom of the ocean and rapidly losing air. How to bring them back up? How to save them? April 20th, 1912. Vincent Astor checks with the Merritt Chapman Company to see how one might drop crates of dynamite over the wreck. The explosions would rock the ship and let John Jacob Astor's body float back up so he could be buried. When the McKay Bennett finds Mr. Astor's corpse, the first salvage scheme concerning the Titanic comes to an end. But others will never cease popping up and all seem crazier and crazier. Yet did they not give birth to another scheme, apparently just as crazy and impossible, which actually led to the discovery of the wreck? Though swallowed by the deep, the Titanic will never disappear from the minds of men. The legendary fortune the ship is said to contain never stops increasing as the years go by. Safes full of precious gems, Egyptian mummies carried in great secret, the estimates skyrocket up to a half a billion dollars, enough to make some people greedy. 
The Titanic can be brought back up, affirms a scientist. One only has to let a pipe slip down to the bottom of the ocean and wiggle it into the hull. Then we blow compressed air inside and the wreck will fly off the bottom. I have a better idea. Expandable polyurethane foam. We fill the hull up and let it expand. That's irrational. Listen to me. We let bags of gelatin sink and... No, we must build a subaquatic robot that will slice the hull up into pieces. What about the Titanic's sister ships? The Gigantic, renamed Britannic, is torpedoed during World War I. The Olympic is totally rebuilt. The watertight compartments are modified so as to stand up to what sunk the Titanic. A troop carrier during World War I, the Olympic attacks and sinks a German U-boat. Scrapped in September 1935, various parts of its luxurious inner decoration can still be seen in London pubs. Unknown in 1912, two people are now part of a legend. Violet Jessup and John Priest, both were on board the Olympic on September 20th, 1911, when her hull was cracked by the British cruiser Hawk. Both are among the crew members to escape the Titanic during that deadly night of April. Both survive the torpedoing of the Britannic. And if Violet Jessup stops at that, John Priest keeps on going. Not content with surviving the accidents of the three sister ships, he also survives two more wrecks, those of the Alcantara and the Donegal. But after this, he can no longer find a job on any ship. No sailor will take to sea if he's on board. He dies of pneumonia in 1935. J. Bruce Ismay is crucified by the British inquiry for not having done his duty, which would have been sinking with the ship. Prevented from fighting back in public so as not to hinder the White Star Line, Ismay's life was shattered by the event. He resigned from the White Star on June 30th, 1913, and retired to his Irish cottage, where he died on October 17th, 1937, at the age of 74. In 1924, Lord William Peary, who built the unsinkable ship, dies. On November 18, 1929, a submarine volcanic eruption creates an important landslide very close to the wreck's coordinates, covering the sea bottom in earth and rock. An incredibly powerful wave speeds over the ocean floor, snapping the telephone cables. Many international experts are convinced the wreck is destroyed, and this conviction lingers on through the 1980s when the failure of expeditions is often blamed on the fact that the liner no longer exists. But some scientists do not give up. We only need to build an underwater electrolysis machine. If we transform seawater into hydrogen and oxygen, everything will float without any problem. The White Star Line is shattered by the affair. With a $2 million loss in the end, the company dwindles. Franklin takes over after Ismay leaves. And while World War I brings some respite, the business is soon sold piecemeal. The wreck of the Titanic leads to the only bankruptcy ever to hit a company in famed billionaire John Pierpont Morgan's trust. The man who had decided at the last minute not to sail on his own ship never spoke of the tragedy. Senator Smith's inquiry cracked the wall, and many more antitrust committees pursued the task, called to testify, under attack by various courts, and under public scrutiny for having broken the law, Morgan is broken. He dies on March 31st, 1913, at the age of 76. A scheme is put together. Sail freighters filled with ping pong balls over the spot. By filling the Titanic's hold with them, the ship will regain a positive buoyancy and come flying out of the water. Strange, nobody wishes to back the project. President Taft loses the 1912 elections. He dies at the age of 72 on March 8, 1930. Senator Smith is re-elected in 1912 and keeps up the struggle against the trusts and in favor of social welfare laws. He's at the head of groups promoting the rights of African Americans and obtaining the vote for African American women. And he attacks America's foreign policy in South America, which only suits Wall Street, causing the Mexican Revolution to break out. In 1919, he loses his Senate seat to Henry Ford, the automobile king. Smith dies on October 11, 1932, at the age of 73. 1953 is the year of the first serious attempt to locate the wreck of the Titanic. The British vessel, Help, drops charges, the echoes of which are used to draw up a map of the bottom to no avail. The Titanic's fourth officer, Joseph G. Boxall, the one who spotted the mystery ship that never came to the rescue, pursues his career becoming a captain. He dies on April 25, 1967, 
having asked for his ashes to be scattered at sea at 41 degrees 46 minutes north, 50 degrees 14 minutes west, the coordinates at which so many of his friends lie. During the Cold War, in the 60s, persistent rumors make the rounds, stating that the Russians and the Americans have spotted the wreck during their underwater mapping missions, but that the files are stamped top secret. Will we one day know the truth? In addition, it appears that the Royal Navy found the wreck in 1975, right in the path of its nuclear submarines. The discovery was classified so as not to give away British submarine routes. Charles H. Lightoller, the Titanic's second officer, was punished by the Navy for lying to back Ismay, and he never made captain. His redemption came at Dunkirk in 1940. On board his private 60-foot yacht, he saves 130 soldiers, returning to England under a hailstorm of bombs and machine gunning. He dies on December 8, 1952, at 78. A recovery expedition is imagined. Drop a huge magnet in order to crank the hull up with a gigantic winch. The project is never carried out. We wonder why. The Carpathia sinks on July 17, 1918, hit by three German torpedoes. But Captain Rostron, the hero of the Carpathia, had moved on as early as 1915, becoming captain of the prestigious Mauritania. He retires in 1931 and dies in November 1940. A company offers to bring a tanker of liquid nitrogen over the location of the Titanic. Then, one only needs to sink it to 12,500 feet below, where the nitrogen will freeze the seawater, turning it into ice, which will trap the Titanic and raise it to the surface. Sunk by ice, it is natural she be rescued by ice. Captain Stanley Lord of the Californian became the victim of the suspicion that he did nothing to save the Titanic's passengers. Fired from his job, thrown out of court, he soon stopped sailing and wasted his life trying to have his side of the story heard. He dies on January 25, 1965, at the age of 84. Even today, the two sides fight it out. Was he guilty of failing to help people in danger, or is he the innocent victim of horrid circumstances? Studies are made on raising the Titanic. If balloons are sunk and tied all over the railings, then filled with helium, we can bring the old liner up. Frederick Fleet, the lookout who first spotted the iceberg, was the victim of a secret plot by British officers. They punished him for having dared to say that there were no binoculars in the crow's nest that night. He suffered a nervous breakdown and quit the Navy. He survived by selling newspapers in the streets of Southampton. On January 10, 1965, at the age of 76, he hanged himself after his wife died. In the 1970s, a young Englishman, Douglas Woolley, decides to carry out his dream, explore the historical coordinates in order to locate, photograph, and raise the Titanic so as to bring the wreck back to Liverpool and turn it into a floating museum. He took official possession of the wreck, but never made it to sea. He was even unable to train his team on the wreck of the Queen Elizabeth, since the old fishing trawler they were to sail in never managed to pull free of the mud. Harold G. Lowe, the Titanic's fifth officer, the one who managed to calm the rush towards the lifeboats, soon made captain. He fought in both world wars, never mentioning his glorious deeds during the wreck. When he died in May 1944 at 61, he was honored as a man who did his duty without fearing for the personal consequences. Then came the scientific expeditions aimed at trying to find out more about the accident. The first was led by the Alcoa Sea Probe in October 1977, sailing with high-tech sonar and photography gear. She never made it, losing all the equipment at sea. Texas millionaire Jack Grimm carried out unsuccessful expeditions in 1980, 1981, and 1983. Then, in 1985, Ifremer, the French Institute for the Research and Exploration of the Sea, sets up an expedition led by Jean-Louis Michel and Robert Ballard. Their ship, Surwa, covers the presumed location with an American deep sea probe, the Argo. After several weeks, on the night of September 1st, 1985, Jean-Louis Michel's team is on watch, 
when an American scientist yells, I can see something. True enough, under the team's astonished eyes, debris can be seen at the bottom of the ocean. Are these rocks or human artifacts? Suddenly, the truth becomes clear. That gigantic round object is none other than a boiler. The Titanic has been found. The Harland and Wolf flag is hoisted, and everybody gathers to celebrate mass over the location at 43 degrees 43 minutes north, 49 degrees 56 minutes west, 12,467 feet over the wreck. The images of the Titanic, shattered yet still intact, race around the world to everyone's delight. 73 years later, the prestigious liner is resuscitated, gracefully lying on pale sand, its majestic silhouette pointing north, and its two halves covered in a coat of rust of many colors. At a depth of more than 12,467 feet, 3,800 meters, where no ray of sun nor any other kind of light has ever shone, at a temperature below freezing, with a pressure of two tons per square inch, can anything remain? Well, we shall find that out today, for an extraordinary adventure is in the making. George Tulloch of the American RMS Titanic team and Captain Paul-Henri Nargelet, also known as PH from Ifremer, will set off to accomplish something never done before, find the objects and bring them back up.